I came chunks of the stuff. As always, most of it's bad news. Uh, deadline say it's been a long example one, quizzes part two. Deadline of fire October 16th, this Friday, end of day, it's 11 to 9, 15, 9 p.m. Exam number two, quizzes part three, deadline of November 13th, exam three, exam four, and quizzes part four, deadline December 4th, also in the day, and exam number five, deadlines of December 11th, the final at noon. And of course, the things are available uh, now, so you can always go ahead and do stuff, but just be sure that stuff is done before the deadlines. And the paper deadlines are the draft, November 16th, plus five deadline, November 18th, Full credit November 25th and half December 4th. Uh, drafts are printed up and turned in either like in class or Dropbox or office hours. And the final version is just uploaded to Blackboard. And the grade there, comment there, etc. Uh, I guess the bit of good news is October 16th, you know, homecoming stuff, so new actual class. Before pressing on to the new stuff, namely finishing up sanitarianism, then heading on to our adventures in deontology. Anything about the previous stuff or stuff that has been that needs more stuff? Okay, so last time we're looking at our good dead friend John Stuart Mill talking about the utilitarianism. And we get up to the point where we're looking at his uh, proof of the principle, and so we'll pick up there. Now, as we saw, his moral principle is the greatest happiness principle or the principle of utility which roughly put is the idea that actions are right as they tend to promote happiness and wrong as they promote the opposite of happiness, namely unhappiness. And we saw that he took happiness to be pleasure in the absence of pain and unhappiness to be pain in the absence of pleasure. And we saw how we handled the pig objection and then we got to the point where we looked at the scope of morality. And we saw that contrary to the ethical egoist for whom Morality of the scope is me, in your case, you. For uh, John Stuart Mill, the scope is all of human beings, and as far as the nature of things permits, all of sentient creation. So they can feel pleasure or pain. Now, if he offers a proof of his principle of utility. And he begins by taking the view that questions about ultimate ends are questions about what is desirable. And so he brings out his proof by analogy. Here's how it goes. If you wanted to prove that something was visible, the easy way to do it is to see it. Because visible means can be seen. The way to prove that something is audible is that it can be heard. And so he infers by analogy, the way to prove that something is desirable is that people desire it. And he claims what people desire is, in the case of each person, each person desires his or her own happiness. And so he takes that as you know, proof, inclusive proof, that happiness is the ultimate end because it is what is desirable, because people desire it. Now his next challenge is, of course, he doesn't want to argue for ethical egoism, which would be my happiness is you know, good for me, your happiness is good for you. He wants utilitarianism. The happiness of all is a good for all. And here's how he does that. Now, to his satisfaction, he's established that the happiness of each of us is good to each of us. My happiness is good for me. Your happiness is good for you. Donald Trump's happiness is good for the Donald. But he has to get beyond that. So what he does is this. He says, well, if my happiness is good for me, your happiness is good for you, etc., that the happiness of all is a good for all. And so he concludes that it suffices for his proof. He's shown what is desirable, it's happiness. Each person desires their own happiness, and it's, that person is good, and therefore it's a good for all. Now, critics have offered two attacks or criticisms of this argument. First one is this there's a the claim that he is engaging in a bit of um, you know, linguistic sleight of hand because. Desirable has actually a couple meanings. So what people, to use the technical term, is that it's engaged in what's called an equivocation. To equivocate is to 
take a word that has two or more meanings and shift between the meanings, but treating them as if they stayed the same. And so what critics say is, he's equivocating on desirable. How so? Well, desirable actually has two meanings, or at least two. One is literally able to be desired. That's one view. So you could say it's something that's desirable, and the proof of that would be you check with people. You desire this, and if someone says, yeah, then it's desirable, just like the visible and all of them. But desirable also is another meaning, not just can be desired, but also should be desired, or something that people should want. So, for example, when people who are opposed to um, pornography say that pornography is undesirable, they don't mean that people don't desire it. If people didn't desire it, there'd be no problem with pornography. People wouldn't want that. No problem. What they mean, though, is not that people don't want it, is that they shouldn't want it, that it's bad. And so critics have said that Mill shifts between desirable, able to be desired, and all you need to do to prove that is show people do desire it, and people do desire happiness, and desirable in the moral sense, that people should desire it. And so critics say he's equivocating. And his defenders say, no, he's not. And his critics say, yes, he is. And then the knives come up. Come up. <laughs> so that's the first kind of criticism. The second one is his critics say he's doing what's called a fallacy of composition. And that's a classic fallacy where someone says, well, what's true of the parts is going to be true of the whole, without adequate justification. So in this case, what Mill is saying is, my happiness is good for me, your happiness is good for you, so the happiness of all is good for all. Now one way to cast suspicion on that is to look at the example of money. Is it true that my money is my money? Yes. Is it true that your money is your money? Yes. Is it true that our money is our money? Well, to misquote Bill Clinton, it depends on what you mean by our. Because if we just mean, you know, sort of abstractly, like this is our classroom, or, you know, our money, just by saying it's like the sum of all of it, we could say, yeah, it's our money. But in the sense of, you know, our money, like having a joint account that we all have access to, it's not our money. And so what critics have said it's that kind of, you know, problem. It's true my happiness is my happiness, your happiness is your happiness. So true that our happiness is our happiness. Just like my money is my money, your money is your money, so our money is our money. But the claim is that the happiness of all need not be the good for me. I'm still just concerned about my happiness. Or so the critics say. People will support Mill, claim that this objection is misguided and mistaken. And then, of course, the people who accept the objection think it still works. Now, the final thing for Mill, and again, this is just a, slim, a thin slice of bacon from the, you know, the whole book, Utilitarianism, is he considers another objection. Because a key part of his view is, the center of it is, the only good is happiness. That is to say, pleasure and avoiding pain. And the only bad is unhappiness, pain, and not getting pleasure. And one obvious objection is, is that people do seem to desire things other than happiness. Well, one thing to consider is, is virtue. We have the expression, you know, virtue is supposed to be its own reward. And of course, we have the virtue theorists like Aristotle and Confucius claiming that you should be virtuous because virtue will make you happy. But virtue is still something desirable. And so a critic might say, well, Mill, if happiness is the only good, then what about virtue? Shouldn't people want to be virtuous? And Mill gives two replies here. First reply is this. Sure, people should seek virtue. They should like virtue. Why? Well, because virtue can make you happy. It's a means to that end. Being virtuous, you know, as Aristotle and Confucius said, being virtuous will make you happy. You get the virtue to become happy. It means to an end. But someone might say, well, what about someone who really, really loves virtue? That's like their deal. And Mill says, oh, that's no problem. 
Virtue can be part of their happiness. To use a crappy analogy, think of like cake. You can buy a cake, but you can't buy like elemental cake, to use a crappy analogy, because cake is made up of like different stuff. Or you can use an analogy like bread. You, know, you can buy bread, but you can't buy like elemental bread, because it's made of you know, flour, you know, possibly eggs, milk, or water, uh, sugar, yeast, etc. And of course, if you're familiar with breads, there's different types of breads. So one person's bread might be, you know, like a, um, a banana bread with bananas. Some, someone else may hate bananas, and their bread doesn't have bananas. It is something else, like um, just walnuts or cinnamon. And so you can have, it's all bread, but there's different types of bread. So you could say that virtue is not identical to happiness, but people's happiness are like bread. They're made of different things. So your bread of happiness may contain virtue, and it's part of your happiness. And so those mills are two, two replies. One is, it's a means to an end. The second is, your happiness, using my crappy bread analogy, is composed in part of virtue. So it's like some virtue in there. Like you might have like some cinnamon in your bread, or cheese, or both, which would be kind of weird, but maybe it would be good to have a try. Now he also considers, of course, the fact that people love money and power and fame. And he gives a similar sort of response. One is, is that money, power, and fame can be a means to happiness. By getting money, power, and fame, you can achieve happiness. You can't, as I mentioned before, and as a great philosopher once said, you can't buy happiness. But if you have enough money, you can perhaps run it until you die. And so his first response is, yeah, these may not be identical to happiness, but they're means to an end. You get money, fame, power, it leads you to happiness. Second reply is, just like the virtue one, they can be part of a person's happiness. Money or power or fame may be so integral to a person's life that they're, again, to use my crappy bread analogy, that it's part of their bread. That just like some people really like banana bread with bananas in it, some people really like money bread. So their, money hap their happiness contains money. Just like their bread might contain bananas. Same with power and fame. Now, it does have, of course, have to consider one intuitive problem, which is this. We generally, although people are busily trying to work against this, we generally regard people who love virtue as being better than people who just love money, power, or fame. Although there's been a lot of work put into making these the highest you know, goods. But still, in general, we generally tend to see like virtue better than love, money, power, and fame. That's my slight margin. So how does Mill handle that? Because, again, for the utilitarian, only happiness is good, only unhappiness is bad. Well, here's how he does it. He says, intrinsically, there's no difference. It's not that virtue is intrinsically better than money, power, or fame, but here's why virtue is better. He says it's just in terms of its consequences. Some of the love virtue is generally going to be helpful, a blessing to their neighbors, someone you can trust. You know, if you're if you hit by a car and there's someone who's virtuous, they don't drive away, they, they help you. Some of the loves money, power, and fame, they in general, Mill claims, would generally do more bad stuff. So it's not intrinsically better, it's just a matter of the consequences. Virtue, virtuous people will generally create more happiness than unhappiness, and those who love money, power, and fame will generally create less happiness. Now, Mill, of course, has to accept that if the reverse were true, if loving money and power and fame more than anything create more happiness than unhappiness, which is what some people argue, that you, know, you should focus on money, power, and fame, the hell of virtue, if that were true, then Mill would have to reverse his, his view and say, well, it's the love, money, power, and fame that matters. He says a more about happiness. He believes he's proved his, his principle. And then, of course, he eventually dies and is still dead today. So key things to utilitarianism are the greatest happiness principle, the pig objection, the proof, and then the final objection here. Before pressing to some additional objections against utilitarianism, anything about the mill stuff that needs more
Philippines would have created this mill and made the idea of it sort of turn? Um, well, Jeremy Bentham is credited with the person to sort of coming up with the concept of utilitarianism, mm -hmm. but Mill took it and he uh, developed it more. Because Bentham, his guy, you know, got observed and his head cut off uh, after he was dead. And Mill came along after him and basically took his theory and sort of uh, developed it more. So Bentham is generally credited with being the inventor of utilitarianism, you know, the term, and then Mill comes along and does a whole book on it and sort of uh, develops into a more sophisticated theory. But, but he's our utilitarian guy. Now, since we know that utilitarianism is not you know, the sole you know, true moral view, because if it was, we'd just say, hey, utilitarianism, it's right, you know, that's all we need to know, there are some standard objections against it. Now, some of the problems are what are called internal problems. These are basically not attacks on utilitarianism, trying to show that it's wrong in terms of being the moral theory. These are basically challenges in terms of sort of, you know, working out the details of it. The external problems are actual attacks intended to try to show why we shouldn't be a utilitarian. So, two internal problems. Uh, first one is for the practical and theoretical problem. It's the formulation problem. Now, all utilitarian theories tell us we're supposed to maximize what is a utility, you know, the thing of value, for all the relevant beings. And here is the formulation problem. The problem, again, can be cast as a practical one. And it's the problem of how do we divide up the, the goodies, the stuff. Because there are various ways, of course, if you have, if your goal is to maximize something, there are various ways to divide it up among the relevant beings. And I'll use, for example, um, well, we could use it, for example, you know, money in society. Suppose we have as our goal maximizing the economy, which is you know, one of our main goals, having the greatest gross, uh, you know, domestic product, the most, you know, clearly put, the most, you know, money. Now, of course, there's various ways to have that. We could have like a really super gross you know, product by having everyone get a slice, you know, kind of equal division or close division of the slice. Or you could have a very few people, you know, very pyramid structure, very few people getting like a whole bunch, and then lots of people getting very little. And both of those could involve a very large, a very big gross domestic product. And so one practical problem using the money one is, when we're trying to build, say, the economy of the country, we want to have the, the most, you know, the most money, but then there's a question of how we, you know, what do we mean by having the most? Is it that a few people get like a whole, whole bunch, you know, most of it, and most people don't have much at all, or do we have like a whole bunch and everybody gets, you know, a close, close amount? And of course, those are huge differences. You know, one system, if you've got like, you know, the 0.001% control most of it, and most people have very little, that's very different than having you know, a more, you know, what people would call more equitable distribution. And utilitarians run into the same problem. If you're talking about creating the most happiness for people, is it better to have a few people who are like super happy? Or is it better to have, you know, everyone being fairly happy? So a similar sort of problem. Now again, that's not a fatal, that's not a, an attack on utilitarianism, but it's a challenge. If you're a utilitarian, how do you go about figuring out what you're going to do? And you could have, you know, two utilitarians who both say, yay, utilitarianism, but disagree about how the happiness should be divvied up. The second practical concern is this. And it can be um, kind of cast as the, uh, the nail problem. The nail problem is this. It goes back to, a, you know, like a children's not a rhyme, because it's a rhyme, but like a children's you know, verse. You know, it's a classic, uh, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost, for want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of the horse, the knight was lost. For want of the knight, the battle was lost. For the want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. And the idea being that very small things can, of course, have very grave consequences. Now, and here's the problem for utilitarian. How do we actually predict the consequences. How do we work out that problem? For example, 
Suppose, uh, I'll use a stupid example, then a better one. Maybe. Suppose you're walking along, dum -dum -dum -dum, passing opponents, and you, when you're, you notice, suddenly you notice they're on fire, and some of them like, you know, comes out the window and throws, throws a baby to you. What do you do? You try to catch it? Yeah, catch the baby. But man, you made a terrible mistake. That baby that grows up to be the next Hitler. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> if you just would have let the baby drop, you would have saved the world. But no, you had to save the baby. You doomed the world. So thank you. That's something you wouldn't think about at first. You right. just do what <laughs> comes to mind first, catch the baby, save the baby. And then later on, you'd be yeah, like, damn, I should have dropped you. Yeah, sure. I would have said that later. Yeah, <laughs> drop that baby. Right. Yeah, well, then again, maybe a uh, baby start out, you catch the baby. The baby grows out to be the next, you know, Einstein. Or, you know, then you did it, then you did it. Then you did it. But of course, you know, you have no way of knowing. So how do you know what to, is it a good action or a bad action? Or you can, you know, try not blaming yourself. Yeah. Or, you know, suppose you, you, you catch the baby, it grows up to be the next Hitler, but then the baby's great, great, great daughter, granddaughter ends up leading humanity into 10,000 years of peace and prosperity. So I guess that was good. Right. But then, her great, great, great daughter <laughs> plunges humanity into a, a million years of despair and suffering. And so they'd be like, how the hell do I know what to do? Right. Now, um, a less silly example would be this. Um, imagine it's um, World War II. You're an American medic. There's an American ally who's, you know, uh, wounded. Do you, do you treat him? He's an ally. Yeah. yeah. Um, you take care of him, he's a rise. But then uh, he goes on to be Ho Chi Minh, and that leads to Viet, you know, the Vietnam War, and so that seems to be bad. But now, Vietnam has a struck. They have KFCs and McDonald's, and they're like telling us, you know, save us from China. <laughs> you know? And so now Vietnam is kind of our friend. And so it was you know, kind of good, then bad, then kind of good. And so the practical thing is, how do we ever know what the consequences are actually going to be? How do we decide? Well, the utilitarians come up with some solutions. One thing they do is this. First thing is, like the point you raised, you know, about the baby. In general, if you catch a baby, is the baby going to be Hitler? Yeah, probably no. Most babies grow up to be everyday average James and Joe's. So probably not the next Hitler, probably not the next Hitler. So. so in general, if a baby's falling in the window, you should probably Catch it, because it's probably going to be a normal person with a normal life. You're probably doing more good than that. Now, there's also what can be considered not just the things we can reasonably foresee, but the things we can't foresee, namely the true and ultimate consequences, which would require like a omniscient view to see every possible ramification of that. And so, utilitarians can say, yes, there's what we can reasonably expect. In general, catching babies is good. Because most people are going to be, you know, average, everyday James and Joes, doing probably more good than bad. Then, of course, there's the real fact of the matter that we don't know about unless we're omniscient, you know, the ultimate consequences. Which of the utilitarians believe that there would be a fact of the matter? If you were, you know, if you had a God's eye view, you, you could say, aha, that's how it all goes, so catch the baby was good or bad. Then, thirdly, they have sort of the subjective thing, based on what you have to know. For example, uh, take a case of like a doctor, there, well, there was a case um, some years back where there was a medication that had been contaminated, but you couldn't tell by you know, examining the medication that it was contaminated, because it was contaminated from the manufacturer. I think it was supposed to treat like people's backs or something. But unfortunately it was contaminated with meningitis, so people got meningitis. And so we'd say that that actually would have bad consequences, but we'd say the doctors would not be you know, guilty of acting immorally because as soon as they took all the precautions, that was not their intention. And so the utilitarians, you know, they take the view they can handle those problems. Now the next ones are actually attacks on utilitarianism. These are things that people who you know, typically would disagree with utilitarianism what they raise is reasons why you shouldn't accept the theory. First one is this. And this is, um, well, these first two take us back to the reasons why we had a distinction between act, utilitarianism, 
and rule. And here's the idea. The first one, unreasonable expectations. Now, we could probably take any action we might be doing, and we could have something that, if we did something else, would create more happiness. For example, suppose um, you get 60 bucks, well, I should make it 65 because of tax, and you spend that and get Halo 5, and you enjoy that. But of course, you could have taken that 65 bucks and given it to someone who has no food, and they probably enjoyed, you know, eating more than you would enjoy playing the video game. Similarly, anything like you're, you're doing now, you could, you could go probably many, many things, thousands of things would be more enjoyable than being in this class. And so if you're doing those, you'd be happier, better off. Or you could be help out helping people. Instead of being in class, you could be helping you know, people who are homeless or ill or injured, et cetera. And so it seemed that everything we could, we could be doing, or everything we are doing, we could always do something better. All our money could go to like charity. Now, the problem is, of course, that if we were constantly, you know, giving all our time and effort to other people, what would happen to us? Yeah, we'd actually be miserable. But every action would, would create, you know, seem to create more happiness than unhappiness. You know, instead of spending 60 bucks, 65 bucks for yourself, you get someone who needs food. That creates more happiness than happiness. Instead of, you know, doing stuff for yourself, you help someone else, that creates more happiness than happiness. But then ultimately, it would seem to lead to greater misery. Which is why the rule utilitarians say, you should be a rule utilitarian. So instead of just looking at each action just in isolation, you look again at if that was a, you know, general rule or policy. So if the rule was you always had to sacrifice your own well-being and happiness for others, as Anne Ron argued, you ended up being miserable. And so, Utilitarians can say, you're allowed some me time and some me money, because otherwise, you, as a policy, you'd be more miserable. So they believe they can handle that problem. The second problem is one we saw before. It's the uh, rights of, my, of numerical minorities. And the example I gave was, um, you know, your, um, you know, suppose you, you graduate, go to law enforcement, you're a sheriff in a small town, like Mayberry, and there's, like in a murder short episode, there's some, or like a Stephen King novel, there's some mysterious and terrible deaths. And they suspect Bob. And you go, you know, get some evidence for Bob, you arrest Bob, take him back to jail, and then you find out conclusively it is not Bob. It is, it is not, definitely not Bob. But the mob shows up and they want to they kill Bob. And they're really full of, like, you know, blood frenzy. So you know either, you know, you try to protect Bob, in which case, you die, your deputies die, Bob dies, townspeople die, or you just let them take Bob. Well, of course, based on the action itself, giving them Bob <laughs> creates more happiness than unhappiness, and not giving them Bob creates lots of unhappiness, and you're dead. So the thing to do would be to give them Bob. Sacrifice the, the one for the many. Now, the ruling utilitarians point out the obvious problem. If, of course, that became a general policy, mob shows up, demanding blood, and you hand people over to them, that would essentially destroy our faith, what we are remaining, in our criminal justice system. So the overall policy would create more unhappiness than happiness. And so they say, be a real utilitarian. Now, this does lead to not just an objection against utilitarianism, but it does lead to some interesting, some theoretical, but some real problems when deciding how much we're willing to pay, you know, for the good of some. And first I'll use like a, a fictional example, secondly a real one. A fictional example is this. Many, many years ago, a science fiction writer, Ursula K. Le Guin, one of the best, really good science fiction writer, she wrote a uh, story, a short story called Those Who Walk Away from Homeless. And she didn't, apparently didn't intend for it to be a criticism of utilitarianism, but people have you know, interpreted it that, that way. And here's a story. It's science fiction, so you're asked to imagine, or fantasy, you're asked to imagine a place called Omelus, which is a wonderful place. You know, picture essentially like a utopia. The people are healthy and happy. There's very little crime. Uh, everybody is well off. 
it's a beautiful place, for real. But like all, you know, just like in every story, the beautiful places always have some terrible secret. But it's not a secret of the people who live there. Here is the, what lies behind the beauty and success of all of us. There is a single child that must be kept in the worst dungeon in the city of Omelus. Now, it's not a secret because everyone knows. Everyone knows about the price. And when people achieve the age of adulthood, they are brought down to see the child. And the rule, and again, this is a fantasy story, it's assumed to be you know, true. The rule is, is that the one child must always be in, in there suffering. No kindness must ever be shown. And in return, everyone else gets a wonderful, great life, a beautiful place. And that's the price. And again, everyone knows this. There's no, it's not like a secret conspiracy. Everyone is brought there when they turn 18 to know the price that is paid. And the reason why it's called Those Who Walk Away From Omelis is some people grow quiet when they see the price and they leave the city. They walk away and never return. Now, people have interpreted this as a critique of utilitarianism. The idea being that intuitively we think that's a sad and terrible thing. That there is this one child suffering, you know, this terrible thing for the good and well-being of others. Now, of course, other people look at it and look at it in terms of, you know, what prices are we willing to pay for the good of the, the many? Because, you know, when we read the story, our natural inclination is to be sad for that child. But, and here's the real example. Think of um, well, like all the cheap electronics and clothing we enjoy. You know, iPhones, iPads, laptops, you know, and the clothing. And the reason why we're able to enjoy that so cheaply is because people in other parts of the world, or maybe even you know, here in the United States, work long hours for very, very, very little pay under terrible conditions. So we can have cheap shirts, because somebody in some other country is getting paid, or maybe not even paid, maybe they're just you know, forced, they're, they're slave labor. And that way we get cheap clothing. And so our, our material life, our cheap laptops, our cheap clothing, all our good stuff is built upon the backs of others. So instead of one child in a dungeon, we have millions of children in dungeons tolling away to make our stuff. And the moral question is, is that, is that right? So the criticism of utilitarianism is, it would seem to say that as long as the happiness is greater than the unhappiness, it is right. And intuitively we might say, that seems wrong. But then we might say, yeah, cheap laptops, cheap iPads, cheap sneakers, totally sweet. So as long as our enjoyment weighs it, it's good. But again, it does raise that important question. For all things, there is a price, and is it, is it a price we should pay? Or, more aptly, is this a price we should make other people pay for us? <clears throat> Utilitarianism is to create the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, right? Yep. So what a utilitarian can say is, you know, on the, sort of the, we might see as sort of the harsh side of utilitarianism is, is if you could, you know, taking the case, the, the science fiction case of Omelis, if you could generate all that happiness at the price of one child locked away in a dungeon, utilitarians would say that's, that would be right, because you would have suffering, but so much more happiness. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's, it's a deal we make every day, because we're willing to allow people to suffer, you know, working terrible jobs, low wages, et cetera, for our, our you know, enjoyment, where we're being. And the criticism is that utilitarianism says it's okay, and intuitively we'd say that's not. But the counter is, we're actually cool with that, you know, because we like the cheap sneakers and stuff. And so in that case, the utilitarian could reply, that's actually okay. You know, greatest good for the greatest numbers. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And that's where a lot of you know, the battles are. You know, how much, how much do we make people suffer for our own good? <coughs> And if you give a final practical example, I mentioned you know there's a lot of stuff in like debates in you know tech ethics, and as I'm sure you all know, uh, Google, Tesla, and Volvo are working on driverless cars, you know, cars, automated cars, and they do have to solve the you know, classic problem of uh, who do you kill? 
And that's, you know, an applied moral problem. You know, your car, as I mentioned before, there's some scenarios, I mean, they haven't got these, these cars going to you know, this point yet, but there'd be a scenario where your car decides to kill you. Because killing you would be better than killing more people. And so there is that question about, you know, how do we do, you know, weigh out the, the cost of things. Next problem. As I mentioned for the utilitarian, at least Mill's version, the only thing that's inherently good is utility. In Mill's case, happiness is you know, pleasure, good, pain, inherently bad. Everything else is good or bad based on its means to an end. And so critics are quick to point out that if you accept that, then nothing is really forbidden. Because if something could create more happiness than unhappiness, more pleasure than pain, no matter how horrible it might seem to us, it would be good. And I'll use like a you know, sci-fi example and then use like a real example. I mean, a sci-fi case would be something like this. If you, or, fa or fantasy. If you, you, know, if you, um, you know, read or watch sci-fi or fantasy stuff, it's easy to imagine like a species that is horrific. You know, think of like the, you know, the, the evil species in science fiction that are terrible, terrible creatures. And they enjoy horrible stuff, you know, torturing things and doing wicked and evil things. You know, I guess. And you can imagine that if, though, if the suffering of others was their enjoyment and they enjoyed it a whole bunch, then that would be the right thing to do. Or if you go, or go and be in sci-fi, you can imagine humanity changing, where we become monstrous. In that case, then uh, all the horrible things that we enjoy would be good, because they create more pleasure. Now, to use a real example, think of, um, it kind of ties into the rights of minorities, but think of like, um, you know, the Roman Colosseum, you know, fighting or total combat, you know, throwing people to lions, that type of stuff. And if people really enjoyed that, then we'd say, well, as long as people really enjoy it, that's okay. Now, utilitarians have a couple of replies. One reply is, as a matter of fact, people, most people could not really enjoy horrible things. Those sci-fi scenarios are just sci-fi. They're not real. The second thing is, is the reply is to say, well, if it does create more happiness than unhappiness, it's good. So if we had, you know, if we re reinstated, you know, gladiatorial games, etc., and people enjoyed it more than they disliked it, that'd be totally fine. Now the last two are um, very theoretical. One is this. One philosopher argued, imagine the following scenario. Suppose you're in a scenario where lying and telling the truth didn't matter, had the exact same consequences. Now, on utilitarianism, it wouldn't matter what you did. But intuitively, the argument goes, we think lying is worse than telling the truth. So we should tell the truth. Now, utilitarians, of course, can apply to this theoretical objection. They can say, well, if it really doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Problem solved. Last problem. This one, for some reason, is pretty popular. Every, every few years, someone emails me this example. You know, you know, you know, I'm sure you haven't heard of this. Here's an example. But here's a, it's also one that's commonly used in um, you know, drama action movies. Now, the original the drama action movie is this. You probably, if you've seen action movies, you've probably seen uh, this kind of deal. The, you know, the villain is captured like the hero's friends or some villagers or somebody, and they give the hero and they say, oh, so Mr. Bond, you know, if you take this gun and kill this person, we will let your, the other villagers go. And of course, you know, since it's a movie about a hero, you never hand the hero a gun because James Bond just killed the bad guy and saves everybody. But the original thing is this. In this scenario, you're supposed to be like an American tourist. I think the original one was set like in Central or South America. So you're out on like a tour and you get lost. You get separated from the rest of the group and you're roaming the jungle and you finally come up to a clearing, probably covered in leeches and stuff. And uh, you see that it's a village. You're like, oh, thanks. Thank God it's a village. Then you're like, oh, crap. And the military is there and they've rounded up all the villagers. And they see you and you're like, uh oh. They say, oh, you know, we love Americans. You give us all these fine guns. 
and the uh, commandante says to you, we're so happy to see you, you know, you're a great American, that if you take this fine American gun and shoot one of the villagers, we'll be so thrilled with your shooting of the villager that we let everyone else live. But sadly, if you don't kill the villager, we'll be very sad, and the only thing that can ease our sadness is by killing all the villagers with these fine machine guns. Now, in that case, of course, what you should do is what? If you're James Bond, you grab the gun and kill him. You're James Bond. But if you're a normal person covered in leeches and flies, what do you do? And the villagers are saying, yes, you know, just kill one of us. It's better that one of us die than all of us die. And if you're a utilitarian, you do what? Sorry, Pedro. <laughs> Awful thing to do, but to save more people. Now, the objection is, is that this would alienate you, which would be intuitively you know, unacceptable. Therefore, utilitarianism is wrong. Well, now, the obvious counter is that sometimes doing the right thing requires doing things that are tough. You have tough choices. And if you don't kill the villager, I mean, true, I mean, if you don't kill the villager, you're not responsible for their deaths because they're killing them. That's also the classic you know, movie line. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, you did not do what we said, so you're responsible for all the people we killed. It's like, no, they're, you're responsible for all the people you killed because you're killing them. But, you could argue that morality requires, you know, tough choices. And it's better the person shoot the villager themselves than have everyone die. And then everybody dies. Okay, so that's my utilitarianism. Before in our remaining eight minutes, anything about this stuff that needs more stuff. Or anything about leeches. And there are surprising amounts of stuff about leeches. They are one of my nemesis. Those environments. Can I return to deontology, which is from the Greek deon, which means duty. Not as in howdy duty or doggy duty, but as, as obligation, responsibility. Now, the type we're going to look at are what are called rule deontological theories. And here's how they work if you're a rule deontologist, you'd believe that morality is defined by rules. If you follow the rule, the correct moral rule, you're doing good. If you break the correct moral rules, you're doing bad. If something is not covered by the rules, it's neither good nor bad. You know, like the rule book says. You know, the rule book doesn't say that dogs can't play baseball, so I guess they're basketball or whatever sports, so they can't. Now, what the, the rule deontologist has to do is they have to get us the correct moral rules. And there have been a variety of options. One approach people have taken is religious-based. You know, the uh, divine command theory is a form of rule deontological theory, where God makes the rules. Yeah, the Bible, Ten Commandments. You know, that's a set of rules. You know, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Now, unlike the consequentialist, for the deontologist, the good or bad of an action depends on the, the rule. It's not the consequences. So it doesn't say, thou shalt not commit adultery unless thy neighbor is super hot. It doesn't say that. It says, you know, thou shalt not do that. So the rules are, you follow the rule, you're doing good, you break the rule, you're doing bad. And so the consequences aren't part of the moral decision. Now again, the challenge is getting the rules. One option is a religious source. People often, as we've saw before, People often turn to religion for their rules. Another option is, as some people have said, that the majority of intelligent and well-thinking people will come up with the correct rules to follow. Uh, Emmanuel Kant, the guy we'll look at, he has a, as we'll see, he has a rule for making rules. Kind of like a programming language that lets you make more programs. Proponents of rule deontological theories, well, would include Moses, you know, Ten Commandments, uh, God, kind of proponent of this often. Uh, John, um, a good dead friend, Immanuel Kant, probably one of the best known of the dead deontologists. Now, why do people like deontology? Well, one reason is it provides, you know, clear answers. You get a set of rules. Do this, do this, do this. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And so you know what to do. And people, even though people sometimes like being rebels and breaking the rules, we also like knowing know what the rules are, what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing. 
Secondly, it has an analogy to law. So morality works very much like law. Thirdly, it actually matches our intuitive view. How so? Well, we saw with utilitarianism that in some cases we're, we're utilitarians. For example, I gave kind of a standard example, there's the plane, you know, you're the doctor, the only doctor on the island, the plane comes in, crashes, you get a choice between saving one people and five people. And you know, the principle of triage, and our intuitions tell us, you say five rather than one, because five is more than one. Again, you don't know these people, they just literally fell from the sky. But we can change the scenario a little bit. To sort of see that we're, we probably, in many cases, we're not consequentialists. That we think there are some things we shouldn't do. For example, let's roll back this scenario. And you're, you're on, the, on the tropical island, the other doctors have gone off to the mainland to play golf, and a plane's coming in, and it crashes. Poof. And, you know, there are five survivors. But in order to save them, you need, um, you need blood and parts. You know, lots of blood. Now, if, let's say it's a, um, you know, well, we'll go with it's a family. So they have the same blood type. They need a lot of blood. And no one else on the island has that type of blood. And your, your blood supply is, you know, gone. Conveniently, since it's a philosophical example, it's always a matter of convenience, a, a hermit who lives on the island, you know, up in the caves, and he comes in once a year to get a yearly checkup. And he's coming for his checkup. And you know that his, conveniently, his blood type uh, is perfect. For that. And he's got enough blood, you, you could save all these people. All you get it. But unfortunately, well, you're not going to be killing him. <laughs> the lack of blood will be killing him. So, what do you do? Well, on utilitarian grounds, we establish that one is less than five. So, drain him, save those five people. But would that be the right thing to do? Because before, we were willing to let the pilot die to save five people. But are we willing to kill someone? No, we don't mean kill. I mean, lack of blood makes them die. It's like, you know, push them off a building. You're not killing them. Gravity is killing them. Gravity is deciding. Them. So in that case, what should, what should you do? And the person, the hermit is, no one knows he's on the island. No one knows what happened to him. You get an incinerator in the basement, no one will ever know. No one will ever know. So what do you do? Let them do it. Hmm? Let them do it. Yeah, intuitively, most people would think they draw the line. It's one thing to let someone die because you don't have a choice. It's another to drain someone's you know, blood. So in some cases, we, we have deontological limits. We think there are some things we shouldn't do, even to, you know, say, save more people or save ourselves. And that comes kind of down to those intuitions. In many cases, we think, you know, greatest good for the greatest number. In other cases, we think there are some things we should, just shouldn't, shouldn't do. And of course, not everyone buys that. There's some people who say, you know, well, we should drain them. Or some people who say, well, yeah, they can go real utilitarian. If we went around killing people to save people's lives, people would be afraid of hospitals, people would go there, so it would still be wrong. Now, our example for utility, for sorry, deontology is a good dead friend, Kant. A little uh, set of form in our remaining um, eight seconds. Kant, as we'll see, bases his morality very much on reason. And we'll look at both theoretical reason and practical reason next time. And so we now come to our end of this section. So next time we meet, we'll finish up Kant, finish up relativism, and then Friday, of course, will be homecoming stuff, which can be good or bad, depending on how you do it. <laughs>